good afternoon ladies and gentlemen welcome to yet another segment of bw legal world's saturday solutions where we speak with experts on hot legal topics and the latest legal developments and today we are discussing the gaming laws of india we will be focusing on the different aspects of the legislation let's welcome our august panel for the day to take the discussion ahead we have with us mr sanjeev kumar partner luthra and luthra law offices india mr yajesh setlur partner jsa mr anirban mohapatra partner siril amarchand mangaldas i am your moderator for the day kostub mehta editorial lead bw legal world along with anurag nagar business lead bw legal world hoping to get you as many insights from our experts in the next hour so experts once again a very warm welcome to all of you and to our audiences joining us across various platforms now anurag will give a brief introduction on the topic over to you anurag thank you kostav so by the expansion of technology in the various arenas like online gaming the availability of games has increased on the virtual space due to the absence of regulations such games are controlled by available gambling or gaming legislations while some states allow online betting activities others have prohibited them now let's understand more on this aspect today as to what does the law have to say about this issue over to you kostu thank you anurag let's dive right into the conversation with our panelists panelists before we go to our q and a could we have a brief precursor to your thoughts on the gaming laws of india sanjeev your thoughts please okay so the question is whether online and offline betting is regulated across india so the answer has to be a clear no because we all know gambling is a falls under list 2 it's entry 34 or list 2 of the seventh schedule so it is only the state governments which are empowered to regulate or restrict any gambling activity and various state governments have come with their own regulations some have been uh, upheld where the courts have now laid down a principle regarding the dominant factor test the uh, factor being whether it's a game of skill predominantly or a game of chance so if it's a game of skill the courts have upheld uh, online games like uh, rummy ludo and if it's a uh, predominantly a game of chance then those uh, restrictions have been upheld in so far as gambling and betting is concerned we have to understand it has always been a part of human civilization it is almost as old as mankind i was reading the law commission report 276 law commission report where they have traced the history of gambling and betting in india and they they note the fact that instances of betting and gambling are found in indian mythology ramayana and mahabharata have reference to uh, uh, gambling in fact one of the they note that the one of the most well known and remembered scenes in the mahabharata is where yudhishthir gambles away not only his kingdom but his brother and his wife so there is a comment over there had there been a regulation regulating gambling at that time maybe this scenario would not have developed <laughs> you this still could not have gambled away his entire kingdom and his uh, family so regulation is much needed but there has to be a balance like we uh, we have presently going ahead with the 150 year old legislation that is the public gambling act which was enacted in 1867 some states have now come up with their own uh, legislation in this regard but it is basically following the same principles as in that 150 years uh, old legislation there also uh, the exception was carved in the section 12 of that act which permitted games of skill to be uh, uh, legally valid same analogy is also uh, being adopted now and even the courts have upheld it now the need is to have some definite guidelines because what happens is even if a game like ludo is held and it has been held by the courts to be game predominantly uh, predominantly of skill and not of chance so it is valid but now there are n number of operators each are offering their own version of the same game so in each case the court would have to apply its mind when it's challenge whether in that case that particular version of ludo amounts to a game of skill and chance so situation is not clear and 
I don't see how any clarity can emerge in the near future. Because like I said, so long as the center can't uh, legislate on this uh, particular topic, that state of flux would be there. Because each state, like Goa permits uh, uh, having uh, casinos under regulation. Sikkim has done that. But most of the states don't do it. So it is very state specific and that is the reason of all these dispute and challenges. Thank you, Sanji, for those comments. Anirban, if you could uh, speak on this a little bit. Sure, sure, Kostik. Thank you. Uh, I think taking off from where Sanjeev uh, stopped, uh, the challenge that the industry faces is uh, twofold. One is that the legislations by themselves do not define what a game of scale is. They proscribe what a game of chance is. That leads to a lot of interpretative authority with both the executive law enforcement as well as courts when they look at, say, a game that is offered by a company. That said, this is a fairly significant industry, not only for itself, but the network effect it has on the overall technology landscape. Now, if you look at the gaming industry, it contributes significantly to development of software, employment of youth in, in the sector, as well as evolution of uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning uh, techniques, virtual reality, etc. That can be superimposed in other sectors and network benefits of, of that evolution is, is felt in other sectors. I think that's something that the government has recognized over a period of time. The union budget had provisions around animation, video gaming, et cetera. So there are concerted efforts as we, as we see currently, uh, both at the central level as well as the state level to sort of take the initiative, one from a revenue perspective, uh, second from development of technology, uh, so to speak. If India is to be a leader in, in the space and a, as a growing economy, we cannot let uh, technology not evolve within the country. I think that's that's one of the key drivers uh, for sort of a lot of executive action that we are seeing in, in the recent times. Thank you, Anirban. Yajas, if you could share your thoughts. Yep, sure. I, I think I'll just add to what Sanjeev and, and Anirban said, uh, you know, because I think they've, they've laid the groundwork pretty well, right? I think this is a sector which is very interesting because there's a lot of conflict between policy and uh, uh, you know individual state policy and the sort of ju uh, jurisprudence in terms of how something like this should be looked at, right? From a court's perspective and from a lawyer's perspective, uh, the principle seems to be, and the way it is, things have evolved is that if this is something that you can control, if this is something that you can get better at, if the game that you are throwing, you are putting your money on is, is something where it is based on your skill, then you should be free to do it. And, you know, the, the way the jurisprudence is evolved is that it's not very different from, you know, any undertaking any other sort of business venture, right? Because this is something that you are expected to know or to control, right? Um, whereas if it's something that's chance driven, uh, uh, that's something where we don't want as a uh, the co even the courts have sort of recognized that when it is chance driven that comes under the the ambit of gambling now because this law because of how old the law is naturally there's a it is quite outdated in in many aspects right and one of the key uh, sort of uh, ways in which it is sort of uh, it's being tested today is the, like what anirban said is that the the number and the nature of games has now evolved so exponentially and these games are becoming so much more complex that it is very difficult to make that clean. I mean, as it was, it was very difficult even for a game that is, you know, thousands of hundreds of years old, if not thousands, but where, you know, the traditional card games, which were well known, where the rules are fairly uniform, everybody knows how it's played, everybody, even for those kind of games, there was so much internal conflict among courts yeah. as to whether it's a game of skill or a game of chance right rummy poker are examples of, of it right now when you take that and then you add to it you know some of the things like what anirban said uh you have ai tools and you have bots you're playing against computer bots you're playing uh rules that get changed every round every game you have different companies that come out with their own version of 
classic games like ludo or rummy they have you have different rules you have different cash out mechanisms things like that it you know the whole this whole framework on which this concept is built of game of skill game of chance is is becoming increasingly uh, uh the you know the ground is shaking beneath the industry in in in, the, in that sense right so one is about how much longer we can continue with this this test of game of skill game of chance and 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 how sustainable it is uh, uh to to control this industry and the second one is of course you know what in some states like andhra pradesh and telangana are, are dealing at the and even karnataka for that matter looked to do is to say okay let's do away with this whole distinction game of skill game of chance it doesn't matter to us we don't want people betting on uh, uh events that they don't have final i mean which is unforeseen uh, i forget the word but but which is which is not 100% guaranteed we don't want people as a policy matter we don't want our residents and citizens uh, uh putting money and and risking it uh, uh on um, outcomes that they don't know uh, for sure right and they try to do away with this entire concept of game of skill game of chance and i think that's where today there is this this conflict between state policy makers and law makers and courts and 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 you know lawyers such as absolutes who see the constitution as the source of of law where you where the since since there's a very clear distinction between uh, chance and skill that should be the continue that should be the test that that we continue to rely on going forward so it's a very interesting time and and for many reasons including the growth of technology uh, uh, some of these older principles are really being pushed uh, to their absolute limits and and it's 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 i think like anirban said we'll have to see how this is uh, uh, how this can be uh, made more sustainable as well as more predictable so that there can be growth rather than the sort of uh, one step forward two steps back game that we've been that we've seen evolve across different states thank you yajas i'll hand over the mic to anurag now thank you kaushik thank you panelists so let's begin with the q and a round and uh, i'll start with you sanjeev so yes. as he just said that you know there are uh, the number of games have been increasing exponentially and so what kinds of games are prohibited in india and uh, can betting be equated with the gaming so what are your thoughts okay so basically any game which involves betting and gambling are prohibited in india games of chance in, uh, involving states so um, in so far as you are querying when the betting can be equated with gaming obviously it can't it's like saying cricket which involves betting or i shouldn't be saying involves betting but there's uh, involvement of betting in some of the matches or some of the tournaments so i it can't be equated with gaming uh, gambling so that is the layman's uh, distinction but if you see uh, the definitions some of the legislation that the states have come out there it is a inclusive uh, definition of gaming so in fact if i uh, take you through the goa daman and diu public gaming act gambling act so the definition of ga- gaming there includes wagering or betting and includes wagering or betting on the digits of a numerical figure arrived at by manipulation in any manner whatsoever on the order of the digits on the digits so basically in the definition it's a inclusive definition it is not equated with uh, gambling but of course like i said t- take a game of cricket it includes the element of there being a chance of uh, betting so any uh, regulation relating to ga- uh, gaming could also be dealing with the possibility of betting in that regard here taking the example of united kingdom they have a uk gambling act of 2005 there they define gambling to include betting gaming and participation in a lottery so there even a lottery is included in a gambling definition so in so far as this is concerned once again the definition of a game is very wide it is an activity or a sport and gambling is a unfortunate sub uh, subtext of that uh, sport keeping in view how popular that sport is that amount of uh, illegal activity of gambling would be there so lastly if you see the distinction between gaming or betting so that came was decided much uh, i think more than 100 years ago by the madras high court and that still holds the field 
that is in a very famous case of the public prosecutor, was a very lull state, where they said that the principal distinction between gaming and betting or wagering is thus immediately apparent. In gaming, the stake is laid by the players upon a game, the result of which may depend to some extent upon the skills of the player. Once again, the issue regarding skill or chance. But in a bet or a wager, the winning or losing of stake depends solely upon the happening of an uncertain event. So, like I initially said, if there is a uh, element of a skill involved, which is the predominant element, that would be gaming. If it is solely depend, uh, dependent upon the happening of an uncertain event, that begins a game of chance. And it's a uh, monster gap. Thank you, Sandeep. Uh, coming to you, Yajas. So, what is the difference between game of skill and game of chance? And how would you classify betting on horses and casinos? And the follow-up question is, how would online games like Dream 11 and Rummy be classified? So, what are your thoughts? Great. I think uh, the the difference, you know, between game of skill and game of chance is uh, so far still entirely fact dependent, right? It really depends on the specific rules of the game that you are talking about, the 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 mat, the factors in the game that determine outcomes. Uh, the you know in in law we have this concept of the reasonable man, right? So you have how would a reasonable person that has played this game uh, uh, approach it? Is he expected to get better as he plays, and and at some point will he be able to determine how easily or or you know how much he, how often he can win, right? And and uh, the the tests that a court will have to apply will also differ depending on the type of game, right? The nature of a, 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 a nature of the game itself. Uh, courts, for example, have held that. Like Rami, for example, has been held pretty much uh, universally to be a game of skill, and courts have recognized that. You know, there are definitely elements of chance in Rami because there are there are it is it involves the dealing of shuffled cards. So there is definitely chance involved in it. But the ultimate uh, determining factor of whether a person wins or loses is not only based on what cards he's dealt, but also what he does with those cards. How well he knows the game, how well he can, you know, predict what other players are going to do, and things like that. So, uh, the the uh, how do you distinguish between a game of skill and a game of chance? Unfortunately, it is still uh, uh, subjective because naturally, uh, uh, each game has its own factors. So, uh, Dream Eleven and, and fantasy sport, yeah, you know, online cricket fantasy sports, particularly, for example, uh, the courts looked into specific factors of the rules of the game. How does a player uh, uh, play? What does he have to do to win? Uh, uh, is it possible for somebody to win uh, uh, consistently? And uh, you know, one of the really important examples that the court, the uh, concepts that the court had to look into was: uh, Does the real world outcome of what's happening in the real world during a cricket match uh, by itself determine whether or not I win in the fantasy sport? Right? Uh, for example. That, that that thin that line between fantasy sport and sports betting or or uh, spot betting, uh, uh, you know, is sort of the court has done a very good job in sort of uh, needling that thread and, and and explaining how these are distinguished. And one of the points that the court, court rightly makes is that tomorrow, whether or not you know a certain player hits a six or or bowls a wide, does not by itself determine here my chances of winning or losing because. However good I am, I may be a phenomenal cricket statistician, uh, somebody who has watched the game for several years, I mean, you know, decades. Even somebody like me, with all my analytical skills, may not be able to determine whether or not that over is going to be, how many runs are going to be hit in that over, or how many sixes are going to be hit in that over, right? It's, it's, a, it's a very difficult task for, uh, I, theoretically, you could say with the right amount of data and a great computer algorithm, I could make very, very well-educated guesses. But the court will have to look at it from the reasonable player who is the average player who's going to be playing this. How is he going to approach it? And, and how uh, how much, how important is his skill and acumen uh, in determining the outcome of the game, right? So, which is why this test is, is it, it's a, I mean, it's a great test in terms of from a legal jurisprudential perspective. It makes a lot of sense. But in practice, when it has to be applied, it, it has a lot of, uh, issues, in, including the fact, like what we discussed a while ago, about how new games keep coming up, rules keep changing, 
uh, the same game can be played different ways in different states in different cities. So how does that? How does how do courts look into something like that? Uh, that these are some of the nuances that come out when you're talking about games of skill and games of chance. Uh, when it comes to things like casino games, right? For example, um, I think for the most part it's it's fairly easy to say that that casino games are games of chance. Uh, uh, most of them, you know, there are specific ones which are which. Uh, which you could play in a casino, but we don't call them casino games. But the the standard casino game that I would you know think about is something like roulette or or the you know slot machines. These are things which are completely almost uh, completely uh, chance dependent, right? Uh, there there so far there's not been any argument that I'm aware of where where a court has accepted that that a game like this would be a game of skill. And also just keep in mind, uh, like what Sanjeev said, it has to be predominantly skill. It's not just there's some elements of skill in it. It has to be more than 50%. I mean, how a court would determine that is, is still a little gray, but, but as a concept, I think we'll all appreciate that it has to be more skill than chance. And for a casino game like, uh, you know, like your slot machines or, or something like that, I think uh, it's very it would be very difficult to make that argument that this is more skill dependent. Um, and on, on with respect to fantasy sports, I think the, the the courts have done a very good job in in, in distinguishing uh, uh, fantasy sports, uh, you know, and and they've they've come to the conclusion that most fantasy sports are uh, games of skill. But the, something that people need to keep in mind there is again that many of these decisions are based on specific fact scenarios and specific rules. So you could have a company that's calling itself a fantasy sports, uh, you know, platform, but if you dig a little deeper, the game is 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 in fact just uh, sports betting, camouflaged as fantasy sports, right? Um, and and that's a very tricky thing because you then have to you will actually have to evaluate whether you know some of the principles that the courts have laid down would apply or are they true in this case? You know, for example, in in Dream Eleven or in MPL and you know these sorts of games, uh, uh, like I said, the outcome of your player participation is not dependent on real world outcomes but in some sports platforms some fantasy sports platforms that may not be true they may actually just be uh, 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 you know dependent on what is actually going to happen tomorrow or today in this game and and de depending on what happens you win or lose and if that's so if that's true uh, then the court sort of the view may not hold good so uh, it's something that, that I think it's important to know that just because the courts the courts have taken the right view that some fantasy sports are not games of chance and are games of skill, it does not mean that everybody who calls themselves a fantasy sports platform is automatically given that benefit. There is still some amount of uh, uh, analysis that will have to be done when you're deciding that. And and I know, for example, that, that when I deal with this in my law firm practice, uh, when an investor or the company approaches me for a legal opinion, uh, uh, you know, and I'm sure Anirban and, and Sanjeev have also had this experience where they you actually have to look into the format of the game. You have to really understand what is happening in this game. How would a player play it? What are the rules? Uh, what determines the outcome? Uh, before we can we can't blindly say, for example, anybody who comes and says I am I am so and so fantasy sports, uh, we can't blindly say that yes, you are not a game of chance, you're a game of skill. Therefore, it's perfectly fine. So, Kostov, if I may add, if I may add, I think what uh, you just said is, is perfectly valid. Uh, fantasy sports, in fact, are one of those specific areas of online gaming where a rich jurisprudence has evolved over the last four or five years. Right? There is a certain fantasy sport operator whose, whose uh, business model has been challenged. Uh, Bombay High Court has upheld. It went up to the Supreme Court. And very interestingly, a uh, couple of years back, the Rajasthan High Court uh, came up with a decision which looked at a lot of elements of how A, the fantasy sport is played, B, they looked at the self-governing mechanism uh, that surrounds some, some of these fantasy sport operators. And then on the basis of that came up with a principle saying that, look, there is certainty around the manner in which it is played. The rules are fair. There is a, uh, how to put it, a mechanism for players to go up and uh, challenge uh, if, if they are unhappy with the results. And therefore, looking at all these facts together, 
the format by itself can be called to be a game of skill uh, taking off from that i think the niti ayog had a consultation that was set out aditi ayog came up with the draft guidelines for regulation of online fantasy uh, platform operators but they had urged states to sort of define the boundaries of what a game of skill would be a self regulating mechanism was proposed there were mechanisms around uh, uh, how these fantasy operators would work helplines for anti addiction etc so i think uh, there what has happened is after a lot of judicial pronouncements uh, there has been activity the jurisprudence has led to draft guidelines but at least the center looking at the right direction thank you anirban uh my next question is to you so on the aspect of taxation so is income from gaming taxable and how much tax is levied on it uh the short answer is yes and just to give a background i think taxation is a very important benchmark that uh, determines the growth of industry uh, certainty in taxation a clean taxation regime uh, are sort of the markers that uh, both investors and new entrants into the field uh, look at to determine ease of doing business right in in that context in india today there are two levels of taxation under the central uh, gst rules one is around lottery gambling etc which would fall within the broader bucket of uh, game of chance which are taxed at 28% and on the entire amount that is paid as against game of skill operators who are taxed at an effective rate of 18% and only on the gross gaming revenue which effectively means the amount of money that they keep back as commission uh, or facilitation fees uh, over a period of time there has been uh, some thought uh, given that this is a sunrise industry how to regulate it etc so you may be aware that the central gst commission is looking at rationalizing the entire taxation regime around online gaming uh, there there have been challenges where uh, some quarters are looking at a flat rate without making this distinction between uh, games of skill and games of chance and a 28% rate for for almost everybody the question is while there is a flat rate what would be the basis on which this rate is applied would it be on the entire amount that a player stakes or would it be on the uh, commission or the revenue that the online gaming platform uh, sort of gets from operating that platform there the distinction was in fact uh, challenged a few years back which led to the jurisprudence in fact that was one of the first cases that led to the jurisprudence around fantasy gaming being either a game of skill or a game of chance in gurdeep sachar where the court looked at it and said that look this this game in this format is a game of skill and therefore will not be taxed at 28% and the entire sort of money that is uh, uh, put in by the player will not be taxed and it is only the revenue that is earned by the operator which will be taxed there have been representations and like many taxation uh, regimes in in different sectors uh, the industry body has made Uh, representations before the government because effectively if the rate is changed to the entire amount that would have a chilling effect on the on the manner in which the industry operates right and uh, that's that's sort of the contentious point the empowered group has looked at it they've made the recommendation the gst council was to opine on it they've looked at it and they will again meet uh, later this month to determine a what the rate would be and b what would be the base for determination of that rate thank you anirban for those lovely comments uh, let's circle back to sanjeev again sanjeev in online gaming there is a possibility of manipulation so how does the law address this aspect no uh, law as such to address to this aspect but of course the uh, possibility of manipulation in any online uh, activity is there so the safeguards i can uh, mention should be adhered to if you want to at least uh, minimize the risk of manipulation 
uh, first would be that they, you sh- it sh- there should be a licensed website and portal where you playing the game. The website or the portal where the game is being played must be licensed and regulated by uh, the appropriate state authorities and the uh, uh, regulatory bodies. This would ensure that the uh, chances of manipulation are minimized because there would be an oversight over this, uh, how this game is being uh, played, how, how the operators are uh, doing this. Second is, there should be accreditation with the RNG software. RNG, you would be aware, uh, is a random number generation, which is a very essential element to ensure that in the online gaming, the chances of manipulation are reduced. Random num- number generation is a very complicated technology and employs various algorithms to generate consistently random outputs. So by doing this, the chances of manipulation can be reduced. This, this uh, like I said, is a complicated technology and employs uh, uh, algorithms and it is based on software to reduce chances of manipulation and guarantee or at least uh, not guarantee, guarantee I think would not be the right word, to try to ensure that there's fair play in the game. Third would be data encryption. Data encryption ensures that our information is safe from third parties. The last in uh, now online games, regularly there's use of bots, robots as they call bots in there. So there are two sorts of bots in online gaming. One which are helpful and used to improve the game and second which unfortunately in some cases are used to cheat or create spam. This is an area where I feel honesty and integrity are part of the game developer comes in. There have been instances in the past when players who have subsequently complained that the boards were used to cheat. Now it could be a case where I as a player could not compete and subsequently as a disgruntled uh, loser on the game because money is involved, I am raising this complaint. But there have been instances in, uh, in the past in this industry where bots have been used to manipulate the return, uh, results of a game. So that is something which also, uh, has to be kept in mind. One case uh, insofar as manipulation is concerned, because like I said, there's no regulation in this regard, but there was a case of MJ Sivani was a state of Karnataka. This uh, related to video games where although it was held that this is mainly a game of skill, the Supreme Court, while determining the issue regarding whether the provision on on those video games was valid under the Mysore Police Act, held that even if video games are considered to be predominantly a game of skill, even then the outcome could be manipulated by tampering with the machines. So based on that, the Supreme Court in that case, keeping in view the possibility of manipulation being there did not set aside that restriction. So, like I said, it would be only a post facto challenge to any uh, such game alleging that there has been manipulation. Presently, as uh, as there is no regulation in this regard, so the safeguards that I mentioned regarding the website being licensed and the portals, those uh, RNG software, data encryption, the use of bots uh, in a fair uh, manner, these are the factors one has to be uh, kept in mind when you go to any such uh, online portal for a game. Thank you, Sanjeev. Let's circle back to Anirban. Anirban, states like uh, Meghalaya, Sikkim, Nagaland and Goa have legislations that legalize ga- gambling. Explain this new avenue of gambling tourism. Thanks, thanks so, so, so one, obviously, Goa legislation has been there for some time. And as we were discussing earlier, uh, the entry permits states to sort of regulate gambling. They can either prescribe gambling or allow uh, gambling or sort of games of uh, chance in a certain way. Uh, the new legislations in the northeastern states of Meghalaya, Sikkim, and uh, Nagaland, in fact, have uh, drawn attention of the law commission as well. Uh, beyond, obviously, the effects of how it impacts states and, and revenue, what it does is it sort of gives a precursor to how regulation of online uh, gaming can be looked at. Right? Uh, so if you look at these legislations, I think one of the few legislations that have a definition of game of skill. Right? Nagaland has a definition of game of skill and a definition of game of chance. Uh, games of skill are obviously permitted. Games of chance are licensed. 
that is an important marker as against uh, other states where where it's only around uh, what betting and gambling or what are the ingredients of betting and gambling and therefore they are prescribed uh, the manner in which they operate uh, obviously the benefits of uh, these are are tremendous one uh, like any other unregulated sector once regulation comes in and is licensed a it leads to effective regulation of uh, players who were otherwise unregulated and were operating in in a manner outside the boundaries of law second it provides protection to the players who are uh, involved uh, so there are avenues uh, for players to go and raise complaints uh, if uh, bad actors or unscrupulous actors uh, operate uh, these platforms in a certain manner a uh, network effects of gst i think they're fairly relevant uh, and and that's one of the reasons why states could want to regulate in a certain manner or operate uh, online uh, gaming or casinos for that matter in a certain manner second it the network effects go beyond these these games and like we were discussing the impact of gaming would be it promotes intrastate tourism within the country which is fairly important has other benefits of uh, industries being set up in states where these are traditionally not looked at as places where industry is set up gives employment to local youth as well as other benefits for people working in other sectors as well right so so one of the main reasons for a city like bangalore to have developed is the exponential rise of services industry uh, one obviously from software there were additional like from Uh, software services to us clients it's evolved now to products and services of different nature development of uh, intellectual property in other senses so those are the Im- that is probably the impact that uh, regulation of gaming would have uh, when allowed within obviously the boundary conditions with which they operated these states Costa, I think you're on mute. Thank you, Anirban. I'll just like to add one thing here. It's a quite an interesting fact regarding uh, casinos in Goa. So the Deltin Royal, the casino on the river in Goa. I don't know whether people are aware. It's a public listed company, Delta Corp. Yeah. And the late Rakesh Junjunwala was one of the important investors in the company. It's listed on the bourses. And in fact, in the last 15 years, it's give, given a return of 500 percent. And the so business of the company is that casino which is being run over there so it's a one of a kind company listed on the bourses there is no competitor presently and i think that is something which can be looked into while going forward because it can't be more legitimate than this the revenues would be there the public would be investing in the company its uh, all financials would be there available with the sebi and the roc so i think that is something which other investors could look into absolutely and in fact i think the 276 law commission had those recommendations it was set up with a certain intent around uh, betting in around cricket and they have set up recommendations they've looked at these state legislations they've looked at international precedents and they've sort of said that look uh, regulation is a better way than than prescribing uh, so the bones that as like sanjeev said uh, i think uh, there is a very famous saying that sunlight is the best disinfectant uh, to that to that extent if if operations of this nature are regulated then the public domain there is oversight uh, it helps both a the economy as well as the individuals who are playing these games that law commission report in fact i have it with me uh, i mean but it is slightly uh, wishy washy because the recommendation that you are referring to first they say that the commission reaches the inescapable conclusion that legalizing betting and gambling is not desirable in in india in the present scenario therefore the state authorities must must ensure enforcement of a complete ban on unlawful betting and gambling thereafter they say however because a complete ban cannot be enforced so there has to be a regulation so i think even they are not very clear what they are recommending i think the moral prejudice regarding gambling and betting is still at play here and that is majorly affecting the um, uh, players in the market 
Right. Uh, let's circle back to Yajas. Thank you, Anirban and Sanjeev, for those great insights. Uh, Yajas, uh, what are the licenses required for starting an online gaming portal? Well, look, I won't spend too much time on this. I think the, the point is that there are only of the position that most players take when they set up when they look to set up some a portal like this is that they're going to operate a, you know something which will be classified as gaming and and as games of skill right and if that's the case then in most states in india um, uh, you know there is no specific uh, uh, license or approval that you would need right there are a handful of states in the northeast which which regulate even uh, platforms offering uh, games of skill and and as as anirban said there are you know, good definitions that are provided and there's a there are interesting uh, uh, I, mean, I mean there's a standard procedure which is there and, and checks and balances to ensure that com these companies uh, uh, operate within the confines of the law and, and and don't you know cheat or take advantage of their customers but but uh, with that aside the the most of these companies that operate are a pan india because most companies are looking to do this across india right? there are very few players who are very keen on looking at individual states and even those companies that we have seen have have been short lived right there were only one or two licensees uh, that applied for uh, these licenses and and uh, have not really seen too much progress in in that sense so uh, most of these companies operate as pure technology platforms uh, they take the view that they are not subject to any specific licenses, which is which is you know true as of date, uh, um, and and uh, so in that sense it would. And I think this is a broader point, which which one of the panelists brought up earlier is that in the absence of a specific law, it's it's also something that the government should consider is is how our general consumer protection laws can be better equipped to deal with these sorts of platforms and how players play. Uh, and, and spend and earn and and um, wager their money on on these platforms, right? You don't have to necessarily have a specific law that that uh, that comprehensively regulates every aspect of a gaming company from from license registration onwards. But you can have uh, uh, you know measures for to con to safeguard consumer interests, right? And and whether that is something like uh, uh, I mean a I know it was said in jest, but it actually makes a lot of sense, right? Something like uh, uh, limits on, on on the number of, of uh, uh, or a cool off period between when a consumer can start playing and and uh, uh, betting large amounts of money. Uh, I think this is something that the industry will also have to look at, and 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 uh, it should. It this needs to be a consultative process. It needs to be something that the industry uh, uh, will need to give feedback on. What tends to happen is that the law is there's a vacuum for for ages and ages, and then all of a sudden there's just a ban, right? We don't have this more uh, nuanced consultative uh, pre-legislative uh, process, which which is definitely needed in this case because the industry has is already at you know it's a multi-million dollar industry, so it's something that definitely stakeholders in this industry should be given a chance to voice their opinions. But it's something that the government could consider rather than having this. Uh, uh, complete authoritarian, uh, you know, this one size fits all sort of law, which doesn't do any good, and and is likely to be struck down by courts in any case. Uh, uh, I mean, this is just some thoughts uh, uh, that we we've, we've had these discussions with industry players, and many of them are uh, would rather have some form of, uh, uh, if not fully uh, self-regulated uh, guidelines, but some sort of co-regulation where. Uh, there is more rational. There's a more rational approach to this, rather than this reactionary framework that we keep seeing uh, on an ad hoc basis from one state to the other. Thank you, Yajas. My colleague Anurag would like to ask some questions now. Thank you, Kostov. So, uh, coming back to you, Sanjeev, my question is: Recently, Karnataka High Court has set aside <coughs> ban against online games, which was challenged before the Supreme Court. And do you think, uh, do different high courts have divergent views on this issue? Okay. No, thankfully, no. Uh, uniformly, the the various high courts have held the same view. The test being the same as laid down the Supreme Court, whether it's a game or skill or chance. In fact, the Karnataka High Court judgment that you're referring to, it's the All India Gaming Federation uh, case, where our firm was also representing some of the petitioners. So, there also... If I could give a brief background, 
the the issue was regarding the proposed amendments to the Karnataka Police Act, whereby the government, state government, had banned online games with stakes, and the act provided punishment of up to a period of three years. So it was quite severe. Not only there was a restriction, but there were penal consequences and penalty up to one lakh. So the issue before the uh, High Court was regarding the, of course, the constitutionality of this. So the Honorable High Court, after dealing all this, uh, dealt with uh, this uh, and held that Section 2, 3, 6, 8, and 9 were ruled to be ultra-wise of the Constitution. They further held that a decision did not prevent any new legislation controlling internet gambling in India, especially betting and gambling, so long as it was in compliance with the provisions of the Constitution. And thirdly, a writ of mandamus was issued to prevent the respondents from interfering with the operation of the online games. So what especially ruled or what appealed to the High Court while uh, setting aside that proposed amendment was basically threefold. They said that the online games are not considered gambling just because they are played on the internet. The it, what was proposed was a blanket ban. So they said that just because the game is online, you can't equate it with gambling. Secondly, there was no distinction drawn between a game of skill and chance. Like we repeatedly said, Supreme Court has consistently held this, that so long as the predominant test returns a finding that is a game of skill and not a game of chance, that is permissible. So it's, that was the second round where the proposed amendment fell follow the high court. And the third was, they said, before implementing the amendment, no study was conducted to understand the negative impacts of online gaming. Because one of the arguments was regarding the negative consequences, the social evils of online gambling. So third round was that there was no study, no empirical data to base this argument on. Based on all these three rounds, this uh, amendment was set aside. And then, like I said, high courts have uniformly applied the same principle while dealing with any such challenges. So, insofar as uh, courts are concerned, there's uniformity and the same principles have been applied. Thank you, Sanjeev. Uh, circling back to you, Yajas, again, why is the regulation better and more sensible option of prohibition than prohibition of online gaming? What are your thoughts? Well, I think this is uh, uh, this 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 sort of question goes beyond just uh, uh, at a principal level. It, it, it's beyond gaming itself, right? It's the overall question is uh, uh, why is regulation better than prohibition for most things, right? Uh, uh, because so I think um, there are different different aspects to this question. One is about fundamentally and from a constitutional law perspective. Uh, what does what does the government have the power to restrict or prohibit, and and for what purpose, right? Uh, uh, fundamentally, yeah, I mean, uh, ultimately, individuals and citizens in the country are granted certain certain fundamental freedoms, whether that is to uh, uh, engage in business or to do what they feel like doing with their money, right? Ultimately, uh, if if uh, and if we come down to the principle of what is like Sanjeev and Anirban was saying, it is it is this sort of prejudice or this moral prejudice which is there against uh, uh, gambling, uh, which um, which seems to be the driving force behind some of the policies that we are seeing. Like, and the question is, does this should the state have the ability to tell you uh, how wisely or how foolishly you should you should deal with your own money, right? Uh, uh, so, at a fundamental level, that's what's one aspect, that one question to consider. Even beyond that, if we say uh, uh, what is why is regulation better than prohibition? The second aspect I would say is you have to also look at the entire uh, um, ecosystem around this that is evolving. Right? These are businesses or industries that have uh, uh, potential to give rise to uh, uh, employment, uh, in the lead to investment, lead to technology and 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 talent uh, uh, and knowledge transfer and growth. Uh, there is there's a lot of potential in this industry which would be completely untapped or or un, uh, uh, underutilized if if the approach of the government is just going to be that because this could potentially harm some uh, 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 users or, or citizens who are who are not able to control or or uh, uh, 
rationalize how they use these games and play these games, we shut down the entire industry, right? And I think that this is something that, like I said, this transcends, this goes beyond just gaming and gambling, right? This could be applied to anything, right? Alcohol uh, in India is, is something uh, very similar nature, right? At the end of the day, while there, while there there is there is a chance that that uh, people could abuse access to alcohol and it may lead to you know uh, harm in their own individual lives. I think as a country, we have for for the most part, most states have have realized that uh, uh, there is there is a lot more good that can be done by allowing it, by regulating it, yes, but by allowing it to to flourish in some form in terms of the number of jobs that is created, in terms of the opportunity that is created, in terms of the investments that we see in the growth of industry and all the other ancillary things that come down from, from that, right? Whether it's simple things like packaging and, and advertising or it's uh, uh, ad revenues, so many things that the, the, the amount of good that it does is sort of outweighs the potential harm. And I think that going forward, uh, regulation is sort of the only uh, uh, way you're going to see this evolve you will have you know individual states that will try and come out with laws to try and outright ban it but but uh, from a constitutional law perspective um, that may not be a very sustainable uh, model and i think courts at some point will step in and say that that an outright ban or a prohibition uh, is an unreasonable response to to a uh, uh, to a problem which is which seems to be which isn't in even something in many like uh, in many cases uh, there has been any sort of empirical study to actually determine you know uh, the the injury or the harm that they're trying to prevent uh, how what is the quantum of it will the quantum will will that harm actually be prohibit uh, uh, you know uh, prevented by this ban. How effective will such a ban be? How enforceable is it going to be? What is the cost of enforcement versus the benefit? You know, without this sort of empirical data, uh, uh, courts are unlikely to allow for states to to infringe on, on fundamental freedoms of individuals and businesses. And I think that, uh, in my view, that's that's the right approach. Right? If you can't have courts, uh, you know, governments banning things simply on the on 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 the basis of moral. Uh, 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 prejudices. Uh, there has to be some sort of empirical uh, uh, and rational thought and, and uh, assessment that has to be done. It can't be based on uh, uh, media hype or or based on you know the individual anecdotal cases of somebody committing suicide in one place because he lost his life savings. That that is not you know while that is while that is you know concerning that cannot be that cannot form the basis for a statewide policy. Right. Thank you, Yajis. Uh, circling back to you, Anirban, my question is, can you explain the infamous RMD Chavarwala case of Supreme Court and a journey on the gaming law aspect so far? And follow-up question is, will a ban on online gaming due to social reasons amount to curtailment of individual freedoms? Thanks, Anirban. I think uh, what we've been talking about, the distinction of game of scale, game of chance, uh, the bedrock is the seminal decision of the Constitution Bench of the Supreme Court in RMDC. Uh, without going a lot into the facts, the the principle that evolved was the Supreme Court looked at gaming, gambling, and had to determine whether gambling is trade within the meaning as envisaged under Article 301 of the Constitution, and therefore enjoys protection of fundamental right of freedom of trade and commerce under 191G of the Constitution. There, the Supreme Court obviously looked at, like Sanjeev was alluding also, and it's referred in the 276 Law Commission report, around the historical, social sort of uh, commentaries around gambling. Right? Uh, they looked at constitu constituent assembly debates, uh, whether the whole idea of gambling was envisaged to be forming a part of 301 of uh, the Constitution of India, and came up with this principle that, look, if it's a game of chance and therefore akin to gambling, it does not fall within the definition of trade as set out under 301 of the constitution and therefore will not uh, get protection under 191G if, if prescribed. That has sort of formed the benchmark for the Supreme Court to go on over a period of time 
make this distinction sharper between games of skill games of chance whether they can be uh, protected or not and the industry has relied on this in fact uh, the government also in a lot of instances has relied on this the principle that evolved after the rmdc case was this dominant factor test and that's important to note because it does not mean a game of absolute skill right no game can be a game of absolute skill it is a question of preponderance of skill over chance so so to give a simple analogy in a game of cricket it can very well be chance that the first ball that is bowled in a match is a brilliant yorker and the batsman goes out however talented the batsman may be the preponderance of skill uh, test determines that over a period of time a skilled player will always be able to do better than an unskilled player on the game, in the game right and that's the sort of principle that's evolved the dominant factor test that has evolved after rmdc uh the supreme court in a in a multiple cases after that has looked at it state high courts have used this principle to sort of determine and in fact the the case that sanjeev was referring to in fact both the karnataka and the tamil nadu high court when they were overturning their respective amendments to the state legislation have looked at it have looked at the constitutional protection that is enjoyed by games that are games of skill or operators who who operate games of skill and therefore any sort of restriction on their activities if overbroad without an intelligible differentiator have been struck down so so what started with rmdc uh, making a distinction between games of skill and games of chance have now led to a situation where if you are operating a game of skill then you enjoy constitutional protection of freedom of trade and commerce right obviously any constitutional protection and this this leans into your second part of the question any constitutional protection that we have as you are aware under part 3 of the constitution comes with certain restrictions those restrictions however have to be reasonable have to be just and fair right that's the whole basic principle structure of the constitution of india taking in the constitutional principles uh there is obviously an element of public policy uh, public policy is executive domain right what is public uh, policy is something that the executive determines and courts very often do not get into the whole concept of public policy other than in very very specific circumstances so yes 191g protects trade and commerce but that's with restrictions now those restrictions as and when they come are tested on the grounds of whether it's fair whether it's equitable whether it's reasonable is overbroad or not and therefore courts using these principles determine whether the restrictions can stand or like in karnataka and tamil nadu and in fact kerala uh, have held uh, that these restrictions are overbroad and therefore in violation of the fundamental rights of the operator and struck down the certain overbroad legislations or amendments that have come through right thank you anirban for your insights uh costa over to you for further questions sanjeev like uh, the burgeoning amount of gaming uh, applications that are coming up so on those lines what kind of opportunities can these mushrooming of online gaming portals create for lawyers uh, first we have to understand that this indian gaming industry is now in a boom phase and this is the trend worldwide also in india uh, as per the latest data there are over 400 a gaming organization in india and we have already uh, surpassed the us gaming user base i think we have around 420 million online gamers us has 300 and uh, the revenues from the gaming gaming indian gaming industry should be around 5 billion dollars in the near future so with this these kind of uh, figures in roll of course there are uh, tremendous opportunities for the players also for the lawyers also one of the reasons i said is the present state of uncertainty regarding various schemes with each state coming out with its own legislation which of course would be challenged by the various uh, uh, gamers players the operators because one example i gave was uh, for ludo even if you have one particular game which has already been held to be a game of skill even then there would be various variants of that particular game so in each case there could be a possibility of a challenge so for as lawyers there would be tremendous opportunities for us like one of the other panelists also said even if somebody is to uh, come into the indian market launch a online game 
So now what we anticipate is before doing that, he would come to a lawyer, show the business model, what the uh, game is about and seek the opinion of the lawyer, whether this would amount to a game of skill or chance. Because now everybody, the players are aware, only if it is a game of skill, it would be permissible. So the lawyers would be advising them right from the beginning when they enter. Then the various licenses and the regulations which would be required, like if you're opening a casino in Goa or Sikkim, so those licenses, those agreements, those drafts, then the tax implications, we have to advise them, regulatory compliances, there could be disputes going forward regarding uh, intellectual property rights, cyber law, data protection. So all these are areas where the lawyers would be uh, involved. And it is a very uh, industry which is in the growth phase and on the tremendous future. So until unless the government doesn't kill the goose that lays the golden eggs. So like we've been saying, the regulation is perfectly fine, but there should not be prohibition. Because what happens is if you try to prohibit something, the players go underground. So the evil that, that is the justification, so-called justification to try to prohibit online games, that would only be much more difficult to uh, check if the players go uh, underground. So then you have virtually no control of the players how which, uh, which pe uh, people are putting in the money. If it is regulated, then at least one can, to an extent, be checking those activities. So the purpose which is sought to justify the provision would be defeated by actually carrying out the provision rather than the regulation. Thank you, Sanjeev. Yajas, uh, my question to you is, uh, what are the penalties and punishments under the law for illegal gambling and gaming? I think uh, this is, uh, again, the, the penalty, specific penalties uh, vary because there are state-specific laws. Uh, but uh, then ultimately, uh, something which is uh, unlawful, illegal betting or uh, gambling activities would typically be punished with imprisonment uh, for a, for a you know, prescribed period of time as well as, as a, a monetary penalty. And uh, we've seen that... Uh, the penalty amounts, uh, you know, while they are nominal, the threat of criminal action is the large, is the is the major deterrent, uh, uh, which uh, keeps people away from from the, that sort of sector. Um, I don't propose to go into the specifics of each state, but but it, it, it will have to be examined on a state by state wise basis. Thank you, Yajas. Let's circle back to Anirban. Anirban. What is the scenario of gaming regulations in the US, UK, and Australia? Uh, to say in a nutshell, it's sort of complicated for a couple of them. Uh, UK, I'll start with UK. I think that's the that's a fairly straightforward one. UK has a gambling legislation in uh, 2005. They have a gambling commission. Effectively, any game that has an element of chance needs to be registered. Right? They are regulated by this gambling commission. Uh, this gambling commission obviously comes up with uh, fairly uh, routine advisories and regular advisories around uh, player protection. Uh, players who are designated to be vulnerable, uh, there are restrictions on the manner in which they can come play. I think we were discussing the panelists were discussing around monetary limits, uh, uh, cooling off period, etc., which is all prescribed by the gambling commission in the UK around this. But but effectively in in totality permitted, regulated, and licensed. Right? Australia obviously has certain restrictions. Australia and, and US have a very similar structure to India around federal laws and state laws. Right? States have authority to, to sort of legislate on their own state actions. Uh, US is, is a lot more pronounced there. But in Australia, online casinos, uh, online betting on sports and games is restricted. Uh, there are states that are uh, permitted to have uh, their own legislation uh, allowing certain activities within their state. Similar in the U.S., U.S. because at a federal level is the is the federal government that sort of determines what, how interstate uh, activities can happen. So, so the governing law there is the Wire Act, which uh, sort of rest restricts betting on uh, online betting on sports right, and games. 
state level restrictions in relation to say operation of casinos or or other slot machines etc are all determined by each of these states some states are more permissive some states are more restrictive right and uh, the determination of what constitutes a game of skill or a game of chance again is very interestingly determined by the state supreme courts right and like in which is similar to india but that that's a bit more pronounced in the us because of the federal system of uh, operation there but again to sum it up there is regulation at some level there is restriction on certain activities uh, unlike the uk which sort of permits everything under regulation and just to add to that what's happened i think what we've sort of seen after that and there are after effects of that in india is that a lot of these online casinos operating from offshore entities sort of try to offer their services to indians uh, under the misconception that they are not regulated or their activities will not be regulated and they are permitted because they are permitted by the host countries to sort of offer these things under regulation mm-hmm. uh, so that's i think uh, something that the government is looking at they are trying to restrict it uh, the recent amendments to the consumer protection uh, act on advertisements in fact specifically restricts advertisements by these uh, international casinos within india right because otherwise it leads to a uneven situation where uh, indian entities are restricted however foreign entities operating from offshore uh, places sort of are proliferate in india that leads to one foreign exchange outflows and uh, these unregulated uh, actors obviously taking advantage of the regulatory arbitrage thank you anirban i'm sure the panelists won't mind to extend the webinar by a short 10 minutes so there's a question from the audience uh, for mr kumar so mr abhishek kisku asks as he rightly said there has been a recent spurt in online gaming in india what according to him has led to this boom mr sanjeev if you could answer sure the answer is very simple the the entire thrust of the government has been on digitalization so the digital india initiative that has been a major contributor to now internet is widely available the uh, mobile phones having smart uh, features are very easily available to the those sector of the society also now we have india has as per the data i see over 560 million internet users that is the second largest user base worldwide so this has certainly contributed to this the tar- tariffs like i said would be among the lowest in the world presently the mobile tariffs so that is a contributor high speed 4g internet has now spread quite uh, rapidly across india all these factors also the factor that over 50% of india's population is below 25 years they are the usual gamers who are playing uh, these kind of games so all these upon to me would be the factors driving this online game Uh, another factor just to add is uh, this covid pandemic this lockdown and people being uh, forced to stay indoors with no activity that led to mushrooming of these uh, online games i think that has certainly been uh, one additional factor that is thank you sanjeev thank you panelists for your insights now with this let's move to closing comments anirban will start with you what are your closing comments on the issue uh first thank you thank you to the team and and thank you to my panelists for this fairly engaging discussion uh closing comments i think what we the, the distilled sort of take away from this entire webinar is that regulation and and legislation is the crying need of the hour right if we are to sort of grow as an industry or uh, as an economy uh, digitization leading the way uh, we need to have uh, certainty around legislation right? that is the most important point second is consumer protection right uh, what we also have to understand is regulation helps users right and as sanjeev was saying uh, an underground operator can get away with uh, lax controls or fly by night operators uh, can uh, sort of proliferate 
without users having recourse to law. Right? Uh, regulation helps bring all this out. It's a structured sort of way for the industry to go forward. Second is this is a sunrise industry. Uh, poor regulation, as you just were saying, was, was one of the ways to go forward. The industry by itself would come come up with their own codes of conduct that is looked at at an overarching level by the executive. But for the industry to grow, regulation should not be stifled. Thank you, Anirban. Yeah, just your closing comments. I think uh, very much in line with uh, what uh, Anirban was saying was uh, 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 more consistent and uniform uh, uh, legislation. And, um, uh, you know, in India, we, we, we like to, to create, you know, tribunals and bodies and things for everything. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think uh, what instead we need to look at here is, is that we already have a, 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 a very good uh, uh, cohort of, of companies that are leading the way, uh, perhaps a, a self-regulatory uh, organization, something which which is more they're making the entire framework more consultative. I think would benefit all the players. I think many players in the industry are are today uh, uh, very sensitive to the needs of or or the the uh, you know the expectations of the government and and are very. Uh, consumer focused in terms of how they they know that you know if you really want to attract users and customers and more importantly you want to keep them on your platform then you need to be fair and transparent in the way you operate right you will always have the bad actors who come and and you know set up shop and things like that but uh, uh, but the larger players the ones that are uh, that that are growing that are making this industry a multi million dollar uh, industry uh, uh, you know, you can't have millions of users playing your game every day if, if you are, you know, uh, on a daily basis robbing them blind. You're right. There, ha there is this level of trust which is, which is, which is already created. There is already this level of, of trust and transparency which is there. And these companies, they know that, right? And and they know that it's important that they stay that way. Uh, and I think the government also needs to give them the benefit of that. Uh, uh, and, and needs to understand that that these companies are sensitive to these requirements, and that there is definitely a way in which they, we can achieve a, a more sustainable framework that benefits the government, the investors, the the stakeholders, including the you know the users, the most important stakeholder who is the user, safeguarding all their interests. And it is achievable. It's just it's just the right approach uh, that needs to be uh, sort of taken. Thank you, Yajas, Sanjeev. Uh, your yeah, thoughts? Absolutely in agreement with what has been said. Provision never works. It is counterproductive. Of course, regulation is the need of the hour. Uh, I was just going through the one of very interesting observation in the Law Commission report where they referred to the Mahabharata and they said, had gambling been regulated during that time, you this could not have gambled away his wife and brothers in that. Uh, so this in uh, social evil has been there. There is a need. It can't be uh, left uh, solely to the discretion of the players or the gamers. There has to be regulation, but prohibition is not the answer. A parallel that I can draw is with how the government is dealing with crypto. There were serious concerns regarding crypto and how uh, the ill effects people were being misled. So the government is trying to regulate it. The same uh, uh, principle should be uh, applied for online gaming also. There should be regulation, and in fact, the benefit of regulation would be it would ensure transparency in the market. There is a valid concern regarding the underworld putting in money in this uh, these uh, gambling activities and all that would be checked. Un unlike uh, presently when it's uh, unregulated, and like we've been mentioning, the revenues which would be generated from uh, these activities, online gaming, would be substantial. So that. Revenue that would be generated by the government by taxing, betting, and gambling would be a good source of revenue, which in turn can be used for public welfare. So, keeping all these in mind, uh, my uh, recommendation, like the other panelists, would be to uh, have regulation, but have certainty in their uh, laws, uniformity in the laws, so that the players who want to enter into the industry are also confident that every day there would not be a fresh challenge. And if that is uh, achieved, I think we have a very uh, 
promising future for online gaming in India. And that is the word to go for. Thank you so much, uh, the panelists, for your valuable insights and also the audiences for uh, joining across all the platforms uh, for their Q&A. With this, we wrap up today's session. Uh, thank you, everyone. Take care and have a great Thanks. weekend ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.